All right, we're going to get started. So uh, we're here to talk about some of our learnings and techniques that we have for reducing biases in the user research process. All right, so um, we are part of the Xbox Research Group. We're both currently working on Minecraft. Um, my name is Melissa. Uh, my academic background is in social health psychology. Before I came to Xbox, I did a lot of research on um, diversity and inclusion across race, gender, and sexual identity in public health. Uh, I joined Team Xbox in 2015. Since then, I've worked in the Halo and Minecraft franchises. Um, and I've also done some cross-game research on people's experiences of social and multiplayer gaming. Uh, and I'm currently a member of Team Xbox LGBTQ, Blacks at Xbox, and the women of Team Xbox. And I do a lot of work within Xbox Gaming for Everyone. So my name is Jerome. Uh, so my academic background is in uh, social and cognitive psychology. Uh, but at this point, my much longer background is uh, working on Xbox first party franchises, which I think I've worked on almost everyone at this point. But uh, most recently, that is uh, Halo and now Minecraft. And then I also lead Team Xbox LGBTQ. So uh, just to give you a brief roadmap of the talk that we're going to be doing today. Uh, First, we're going to be talking about the positive and negative biases that all humans have and how those biases affect game development. Then, we're going to talk about uh, combining games, users, and research into games, user, research and how that can help reduce game development bias. But those same biases that affect game developers can affect researchers. And then last, uh, we're going to talk about work we've been doing in our group to reduce those biases. Uh, reducing or completely eliminating bias is a big challenge for everybody, so this is very much a work in progress for us. But this is something that we wanted to share where we are, and hopefully we'll be able to learn from all of you after you hear what we've been doing. So uh, first, uh, we're going to talk about bias and how it shows up in game development. Uh, since many of us here are researchers, I'm sure you're familiar with many of the biases that we're going to talk about. But this is something that uh, we wanted to share in addition for your knowledge because we've found this uh, framing of biases to be a really helpful thing when talking to game developers to help them understand how their own biases come into play when, uh, when they think about their players. So going back to basics here. Uh, so. This sentence here, or partial sentence, is actually a sentence that uh, we wrote in our group over 10 years ago as a description of what we do, uh, all about collecting unbiased data. Uh, but uh, I really wanted to dig in here in this talk about what it means to, to be unbiased and to collect unbiased data. So uh, just to define bias here, uh, so bias is a preconceived positive or negative opinion uh, and something that doesn't match reality. So thankfully, in uh, the games industry, most people recognize uh, bias is a bad thing. Uh, they want to help reduce their biases. But biases can show up in uh, less obvious ways as well. Uh, a lot of people have good intentions, but they unintentionally exclude players or disadvantage them in some way. And especially players who have different play styles or experiences from their own. So this is something all humans have these unintended biases, and they skew our judgment. And they really are automatic for all of us just because of the way that our brains work. So as you know, these biases happen because there's so much for our brains to consider at all times that in order to deal with it all, our brains use heuristics, or these short, simple, efficient rules that help us make decisions unconsciously. So we're not brain scientists, so shout out to all of you who are, and apologies in advance for oversimplifying the brain a bit. Um, but there, we know that there are a lot of different neurological systems that work together and contribute to bias. We're just going to use one as an ex a simple example that you can use to explain how that works. Um, so here we have the fusiform face area. Um, it's an area of the brain that helps us recognize faces and distinguish them from one another. You learn to quickly recognize the faces of your in-group, who are people that you're consistently exposed to as you grow up in your own environment. However, you don't get really good at distinguishing faces of out-groups, so people that you're not exposed to on a consistent basis. Uh, neuroscience research involving brain scanning and analysis has shown us that we can't recognize faces of out-group members as easily, and we can't distinguish between them as quickly. Since humans are often automatically less comfortable with things that are unfamiliar to us, this can trigger some unpleasant but unconscious reactions to members of outgroups, reactions that you don't necessarily want to have or even know that you're having since it happens on an unconscious level. 
All right, so what we're really talking about here is unconscious or implicit bias. Uh, so I was a research assistant in school in a lab where an unconscious bias measurement tool was developed called the implicit association test that's shown here. Uh, so how many people here have tried the implicit association test for themselves? All right, great. So for anybody who hasn't, uh, this is a test that measures what your brain does automatically uh, based on reaction times. So it's all about uh, whether it's more automatic for you to associate groups or concepts with positive or negative ideas. So uh, this goes back to those automatic mental shortcuts. It's easier for our brains to jump to some conclusions than others. And it's true even if we'd like not to have these biases. Uh, the researchers behind this test, uh, Banaji and Greenwald, they refer to this as the hidden biases of good people. And I think that's a pretty good way to sum it up. So this extends definitely into game development and the, uh, the biases that game developers have about players. I'm sure if you think about game developers that you know, uh, some of them probably have preconceptions about categories of players, such as uh, highly competitive multiplayer players, uh, people who stop playing our game, or uh, people who comment on our YouTube videos. <laughs> they, but the, the, uh, they and maybe you have a picture in your head of what those people look like. So when you're dealing with automatic mental processes and hidden biases, it's hard to counteract even if people have the best of intentions. We can make sure that we're not excluding or disadvantaging players based on any number of factors, including identities, backgrounds, skill sets, and preferences. Luckily, it's not actually impossible or harder than world peace. Uh, we all in this room know how much games user research can help with incorrect assumptions and beliefs about players. But biases can get baked into the development process in ways that are not solved solely by introducing some user research into that. So we wanted to point you to some resources to combat that. Uh, and some of it has to do with the approach that the whole development team takes. All right, so uh, one thing when putting together a development team, it's really important to think about the unconscious biases there are that affect team composition and how the team communicates. Uh, so Microsoft actually has created some unconscious bias training that's 100% free and available for anybody to take, uh, and it's, we'll have a link to it at the end. But it's, uh, if you haven't seen it, it's a really good start for you and others you work with to start thinking about how to address unconscious bias. And it covers some topics including how greater team diversity can lead to more creativity and productivity, and also ways to avoid team member exclusion uh, due to communication style, background, or team culture, as well as many other things. So another thing to think about uh, when your team is getting started is the approach to customers. So for anybody who was here for Tom and Lauren's talk just before lunch, this is, uh, this is the inclusive design approach. Uh, if you weren't, uh, what the inclusive design approach is really all about is focusing from the start on how to better include players. Uh, these may be players who are unintentionally excluded in the past, and uh, that diverse team member perspective that I was talking about in composing your team is something that really enhances that inclusive design approach in terms of bringing more perspectives to the process. Uh, this also, there is a toolkit for it, and we have a link at the end. And so now, you've got your team together. They're trying to take an inclusive approach. How else can bias show up in the game development process? So here's where we get back to that unbiased data that we started with. Game designers and other developers very much want to make a great game experience for their players. They have their own ideas about who those players are, how they play, and how to understand them. As games user researchers, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the biases that development team members can bring to player understanding. But as we talked about, this is a framework that we've found is really useful for explaining psychological principles behind bias and establishing some common language with development team members um, who may not be as familiar with research. So first is the false consensus bias, which leads us all to believe that our perspectives are more typical and widely shared than they are. The false consensus bias makes us assume that other people think just like us, or at least more like us than they actually do. In game development, it can often make us think that other people play and enjoy games exactly the same ways that we do. Of course, the truth is that game developers are not just like everyone else. Um, months or years of working on a game, or just in-game development in general, uh, means that developers are already coming from a very different perspective than most players. And even if they realize that their perspective is different, the curse of knowledge bias gets in the way, which makes it impossible to break outside of that perspective. 
A lot of research has shown that people are unable to ignore information that they hold, even when it's in your best interest to do so. Being an expert makes it really difficult to place yourself in the mindset of someone who doesn't have the private additional knowledge that you already have. You're cursed with that knowledge. Um, and being an expert in game development actively gets in the way of player understanding. The false consensus and curse of knowledge biases combine to lead developers to form misconceptions about real players, and they can exclude or disadvantage those who don't match those misconceptions. All right, so if you're a game developer, you can't rely entirely on your own perspective, and you need to get feedback and try to understand other people's perspectives. So uh, here we get into uh, another bias, which is that humans assume that feedback that reaches us most easily is the most popular and important feedback. And we assume that other feedback is less popular and important, which is the availability heuristic. So in game development, it's very, very easy for people to pay the most attention to the loudest voices out there, or the voices that are most available to them. Uh, that can be anywhere that loud voices show up. It can be uh, online on forums, social media, Reddit, anywhere that has a small proportion of loud voices. And those voices really should be listened to in proportion with the rest of the audience. So that vocal minority of players whose opinions are most available to, uh, to developers, they often differ from quieter players in systematic ways, and the game gets customized them in, in ways that leave those quieter players out. Uh, so I'm going to talk about one example here of how, those, how skewed those kind of opinions can be from some research we've done in Xbox research. So uh, during Halo 5 development, uh, the team heard a lot of feedback. Uh, they had put out a beta. It was something they had included some new features, brought back some old ones. And they heard lots of community feedback about that beta. And a lot of the feedback centered around whether players should be able to sprint in the game or not. And uh, based on online conversations, uh, the team came to us and said, hey, this really seems like it's a 50-50 split. About 50% of, uh, of players we hear from really love Sprint, want it in the game. About 50% say, no way, this shouldn't be in the game at all. So we ended up doing some research with a larger and broader set of players than who they were hearing from. And uh, we found out that it was only 13% of engaged players who are opposed to Sprint, and 87% of their engaged players were totally fine with it. And this is something uh, that we had done some earlier research to understand more about how these groups differ, and we'd asked people about how much, how much do you uh, participate online in discussions about Halo? And kind of unsurprisingly, based on these results, the, the uh, the anti-sprint people were much more vocal online, so that's why uh, the developers were hearing from them much more often. And of course, another danger in trying to gather feedback in any kind of group or public setting is social influence bias. Um, hearing other people's opinions can actually lead people to change what they say themselves, or to simply not say anything at all if they disagree with the original commenter's thoughts. Uh, this research actually started in in-group person, uh, in in-person groups, uh, but newer research has focused specifically on online environments, and it's replicated those results. There, we've, there have been some randomized experiments done, actually, um, an article that was published in Science that involved evaluating and rating things on social media that showed that if you plant some false positive reviews of a product, you inflate subsequent ratings of other people online who have read those, and doing the opposite, planting false negative reviews, do, does the same thing. Um, some people do love to argue, but a lot of people don't. And dissenting opinions often get silenced in group um, experiments. Uh, so you may have heard about some research into how marginalized people's voices aren't heard as much in the classroom and workplace and other social settings. And the same thing applies to other social environments as well. And there's one last bias that gets in the way when people try to gather feedback, confirmation bias. We pay more attention to information which lines up with and confirms our previous beliefs and we pay less attention to information that contradicts those beliefs. All right, so we just talked about a whole lot of biases. Uh, so thankfully, uh, game development teams like the ones that many of you work for or hope to work for have games user researchers to help them reduce these biases. Uh, and 
through what we do as our job, we can help get them that unbiased data we were talking about and a less biased view of the player experience. Unfortunately, exactly the same biases that we were talking about can influence the user research process, but in different ways. So as researchers, we can apply research methods to try to get representative feedback from across the gaming audience. And this uh, helps combat the availability heuristic by making more viewpoints available to the development team. So as researchers, we can apply research methods to get that representative feedback across audiences. Um, and that combats the availability heuristic by making more viewpoints more available to the development team. But what's depicted here is often not the reality of doing research. We're not paying equal attention to everyone in our audience. Sometimes we have very good reasons for focusing on specific parts of the gaming audience, but we should be very conscious of our choices and who they include and exclude. So for example, in availability, let's first talk about reaching participants. So who here has done research that relies on people signing up in some way to give feedback, such as being a fan of a franchise, early access, a beta? What about research with people who play a game within a certain duration of a time, like a specific week or day? Yeah. Research in which people may have to self-identify as a gamer in order to find out about the research in general, like going on a gaming news site or gamer social media. Yeah. There may well be players in that audience that we're not reaching or who would never have the opportunity to take part in research if they're only recruited in these ways because they don't show up in those places. And we may be reaching some kinds of players who want to take part but they're unable to or reluctant to for a variety of reasons. Maybe there's research that requires people to take multiple hours out of their day um, at a time where people with jobs or who are in school who have childcare needs actually can't make it to the research. Research that relies on people getting to a specific location or research that people just don't think is for them because they're not enough of a gamer to participate. <laughs> Volunteering, specific time, and also enjoying research. Even for players and audience members that we do reach, often as researchers, we're filtering them out of participation. So some of the limits that we have are in place for good reasons, like legal restrictions. Um, some there, sometimes they're there for less good reasons, like too narrow definitions of our gaming audience. So for example, who here has had an age limit for a study? Uh, a minimum or maximum age for participants? There might be some players in your audience that are actually outside of those age limits that have been set. Also, what about research that focuses solely on current players of a game or franchise or beta participants? What are you potentially missing about those who maybe have stopped playing the game or who are in the audience but not playing the game for whatever reason? We can dig into some of those. Participants can also get excluded by improper use of proxy variables to define if someone is in the audience for a game. So for some reason, rather than asking people directly whether or not they play certain games or on a specific gaming platform, some researchers have used proxy variables that exclude parts of the audience. And all real proxy variables that we've seen in gaming research are how long their gaming sessions are, how many hours someone plays per week, whether or not someone defines themselves as a gamer, their employment status or income, and the amount of money that they spend on games in a specific duration of time. And by the way, uh, this book, Weapons of Math, Math Destruction by Kathy O'Neill, actually has a couple of chapters with great discussions of proxy variables and how they can sort of harm data collection and analysis. All right, so going through those, that list of availability biases that can show up in research, it may not have seemed completely fair, uh, for an individual study, there are often very good reasons why you want to restrict participation because of the focus of the study. But unfortunately, doing that thoughtlessly can mean that your collection of research can have a cumulative effect where you're hearing much more from certain kinds of players than other ones. And the uh, access that you have to players' voices can look a lot like that, uh, that availability bias influenced access that we talked about for game developers. The, there are voices that, they're, that are reaching you much more often than others, and that's exactly what, re, as researchers, we're trying to combat. So uh, we're going to move on now into talking about our toolkit for addressing this. So the reality research is, for anybody, kind of no matter the, the size or resources you have, is that there are always limited budgets, there are always limited time, there's always limited resources. And some people are literally just more expensive to reach with research. Uh, but we can be much more deliberate in our research choices to hear more from, hear from more people in the game's audience and hear from types of players we're not hearing from already. And often we can help reduce bias by refocusing the resources we already have without even spending additional resources. 
So some of the approaches we're taking. Uh, first is uh, understanding who you're missing. So the first thing you can do is measure player behavior patterns, uh, often through telemetry, and compare that to your research participants. You can look at who's well represented, who's poorly represented in your research participants. And uh, some kind of obvious differences that we've seen that, that are ones that should be obvious to all of us, but it's something that can really affect, affect things when you look overall at your research, is that players who play less are less likely to respond to research. And players who play less are also more likely to have negative opinions of your product. So you're probably hearing fewer of those negative opinions than you would if you were reaching across the entire audience. So second, you can look at what types of players you're missing and do audience research or consult other audience research to better understand the whole world of players out there. So maybe uh, industry research out there on what the gaming audience looks like as a whole. It could be players on the platform that you're aiming for for the title or players for similar games and just really look at who's missing. So once you have that understanding, you can move on to ways to expand, that, expand your research participation. So first, you can expand where you look for and recruit participants. Uh, we do some specific work on looking at where we have those gaps and targeting both physical places and online places where people tend to gather where, uh, that have a high concentration of people we're not hearing from otherwise. Also, uh, Time-wise, it's unavoidable sometimes. We need to do research that requires a, a big time commitment from people to be able to deeply understand their experiences. But that doesn't mean that needs to be all your research. It's something that you can really fill in the gaps with shorter research and research that fills all, t uh, all different time availabilities so that you are hearing from more people across, uh, across their own availability. Third. Focus on being where the players are. So this can be uh, in a virtual sense, uh, looking, uh, doing research in game, doing research online, doing research remotely where you're contacting people in their homes. But you can also target research for unique play environments. So for example, uh, we both work on Minecraft. Minecraft is something that's used in schools. And there are certain kinds of learnings you can only get from seeing how it's actually used in the classroom environment. Another great example actually is uh, one of our coworkers, uh, Melissa DeWolf, recently did some research on children's hospitals. Uh, re uh, games are used a lot in children's hospitals for recovery, uh, but they're used in different ways with over different time periods with different restrictions due to the tr treatments that are going on that there are really ways that we can help make those games better in those environments in ways that you may not be thinking about. So, First, you've tried to understand. Then, uh, then you've tried to expand participation. Third, you really want to focus on spending your research time where the gaps are the biggest problems between those well-represented players and underrepresented players, focusing on their opinions, their behaviors, their experiences, and then spend your resources accordingly to help understand those differences and get those unique learnings from those people you may not be hearing from otherwise. So as researchers, we can cut down on social influence bias through methods that use individuals, not groups. In social science, we've known since 1939, Simpson, that group discussions change the opinions that people report. And as we already mentioned, experimental research done online shows that that's true about digital or internet-based situations as well. There's a lot of research to indicate that people in groups converge towards one opinion, and that opinion tends to be more extreme than the one that they would hold if they were answering a question on their own. So for example, I hate Sprint, it'll ruin the game, versus Sprint may be okay, but it's not for me. Thankfully, uh, individual-based research does tend to be the rule in most games user research. However, there are a few things to consider. First, use group, second, uh, group settings, like focus groups, for what they're best for, which is idea generation, where you get the value of people bouncing ideas off of each other. But don't use it for opinion measurement, where it's impossible to separate out the effect of the loudest voices and the opinion change. Another thing that we can do is adjust analysis where social influence is unavoidable. For example, if we're doing research on multiplayer gaming sessions, the other players will impact the experience of each individual in the session. 
Thus, the individuals become non-independent units of analysis. And some of the assumptions of our classic analysis techniques are actually violated there. In these cases, we really should treat the multiplayer group as the unit of analysis, um, as a cluster, not the individual. However, we know that that takes a lot of analytical power and a lot of people, so an alternative is to manage multiplayer matchmaking in a gaming session to try to introduce as much independence into the experience as possible. You can place or randomize players into different multiplayer groups throughout the session to try to introduce that independence. For research topics that are heavily discussed within a gaming community, it might take a little bit of angling to break through and go past the group consensus. For example, again from the Halo Sprint research, we didn't just ask Sprint, thumbs up, thumbs down. We dug into how players felt about the Sprint in the game as a whole, what they thought about Sprint for other people, what they thought about it for themselves, and what effect they perceived that it would have on the game as a whole. We also asked some questions that on face didn't necessarily seem related to Sprint, but were important for understanding the issue. For example, we asked players how important Spartan mobility was to them. And this helped us make the Sprint experience better for everyone. So those are all kind of general techniques we've used to reduce research bias, uh, to get us closer to being able to see everyone in the audience and reach them with research. But we found, even after using some of those general techniques, there are still certain kinds of opinions that were disproportionately excluded. There are certain, uh, definitely certain kinds of players that were disproportionately excluded. And we really needed more targeted techniques. So the reason for this is that things like play styles or preferences or experiences are not evenly distributed across the population. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that was done by a researcher named Dr. Margaret Burnett at Oregon State University called Gender Mag. Uh, but it was looking at individual differences in software problem solving and how that clusters by gender. So looking at here is how much uh, people tend to prefer to tinker and experiment to figure things out with software. This is something that uh, the blue bars are males, the light pink bars are females, and I think the important thing here is that those bars don't match up. There's a different distribution, and if you have a game that's relying uh, a lot on people tinkering, experimenting to figure things out, you're probably disproportionately excluding females. A couple other examples, uh, we talked a couple times about the sprint research that was something that, uh, that uh, there was a big difference between those who are vocal online and not. And there are lots of other examples out there. Uh, for example, uh, Nick Yee from Quantic Foundry is going to be talking later, later today, uh, presented last year, about competitiveness and how that interacts uh, with age and gender and how that uh, can disproportionately exclude people who aren't as competitive. So those uneven distributions sometimes do cluster by demographic categories such as gender, race, ethnicity. Uh, and to understand the disproportionate effects, you need to measure how the players in your audience identify. So here are some things to consider when you're asking players about their identities. First, make sure that your response options make people feel represented and not excluded. Always have an open-ended response option and periodically analyze those responses to the open-ended question to s determine whether you need to add additional categories or change the existing ones that you have. So for example, on some current research that we've done, we've analyzed some open-ended response categories and noticed that we needed to add an additional category for Middle Eastern or North African identified folks um, to capture those people who identified that way um, there. It's good to get feedback on those questions from other people in your team and that's why it's always good to have a diverse team as well to give that kind of feedback there. Um, also, always allow people to opt out, have a preferred not to answer category so that people can choose not to answer the question if they don't want to. Um, consider also that how um, people identify is going to vary by region and location. So if you're conducting some international research, you might need an international version of this question. And additionally, some of the questions that you ask could pose some legal complications. So for example, some questions about health conditions or disability status may be interpreted as collecting medical information, even if you're just asking people whether or not they have one. And also in some regions, asking people about things like their sexual orientation and gender expression can actually expose them to legal risk in their countries. So make sure you talk to your legal department when you're putting these questions together. But researchers need to be careful about another effect of asking players about their identity, which is stereotype threat. Stereotype threat is a predicament in which people feel at risk of confirming negative stereotypes about some group that they belong to. People often get so stressed out trying to disprove stereotypes 
that the stress unintentionally and negatively drives down their performance. For example, if you're a woman and you've heard of a stereotype that women are worse at competitive multiplayer games, that can actually how you affect how you perform at competitive multiplayer games. It doesn't actually matter whether or not you think the stereotype is true. Your performance is still affected just if you know that it exists. One thing that can make the effects of stereotype threat worse is making someone think about their group membership. So recently, researchers have been investigating this directly in gaming, and it still holds even within a gaming environment. Women who felt more threatened at the beginning of a gaming session completed fewer levels and performed more poorly than women who did not. And the presence of male opponents exacerbated that poor performance for the threatened women, but not for the women in the control condition. So for a re from a research perspective, there's an easy way to avoid this trap. Don't ask people identity or demographic related questions before they play or at the beginning of a session. Ask about them at the end of a play session. Another potential factor is the makeup of gaming sessions. Research in many domains has shown that threat decreases as representation in the stereotype domain increases. So this has implications for any group settings, such as play tests and focus groups. We need to pay attention to the makeup of our group gaming sessions and try to make them more diverse in an effort to reduce threat. So when you want to talk to players about gaming experiences related to their identities, there are several other things to consider. One, start with less sensitive topics and build some rapport by establishing common ground. This gives your players the comfort and the confidence to want to talk about those sensitive topics. And this is another good reason to have some diverse teams as well. Um, anticipate your players' needs and adjust appropriately. So one of the things that we found out when we've done research is that some, but not all, deaf and hard of hearing players communicate through sign language. Some do lip reading, and some are bothered by the presence of an interpreter at all. So make sure that you ask up front what kind of accommodations people need and don't assume. Uh, another example of that is Microsoft's autism hiring program, which we'll link to at the end. Uh, there are several adjustments that we've made to our hiring process to make it more predictable and to reduce unnecessary pressure. So we can apply some of those same principles to our gaming sessions, trying to keep the process predictable, and reducing pressure can help those with similar challenges adapt. Also, be aware of past research on identities and how it affects how people might respond within a session. So for example, women and people of color tend to have lower self-efficacy about their skills and abilities surrounding technology usage. So different ways of advertising a task or a session might influence people's decisions to participate. For example, if you put an ad up that says, we're looking for skilled, avid, or experienced gamers, that might exclude some people who don't necessarily see themselves that way and might disproportionately exclude women and people of color. They're also a little bit more likely to be self-deprecating about their skills and abilities in a session. So some participants might engage in what we call discounting behavior, um, with statements like, I'm not a real gamer, or maybe I don't know this because I don't really play this game that much. Their statements might not actually be reflective of their actual experiences. They're just trying to discount so they don't feel as bad in the session. So we need to take this into account in our analysis and discussion of findings, especially when um, presenting them to developers. One thing that we can do to combat this is to remind participants that we're testing the product and not them. And also communicating that people from diverse groups have found success in the task, and that might help participants focus more on the task and not specifically on their identities and the stereotypes thereof. So research gets even more challenging when you want to try to understand the negative gaming experiences that players might have, especially if they've been targeted based on their identities, like their gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, or gender expression. So we've done some research on online harassment in games, and we found that a lot of people who are targeted for their identities actually don't report or talk about their bad experiences, even when we directly ask them about them. This very likely means that we're actually underestimating the severity and the frequency of those events. We've discovered some reasons for this um, underreporting that can help other researchers when they're trying to understand bad experiences. So players feel that harassment is inevitable and so widespread that it's actually become baked into the player culture. So in order to combat this, a lot of our players have told us that they feel like they need to develop this thick skin to protect them um, from those effects and to pretend like they're unbothered um, or that they don't have any kind of uh, negative emotional reaction to harassment. In their eyes, being defensive about harassment only increases the um, opportunity for them to get targeted. So what this means is that our, our players set a really high bar for the kinds of gaming incidents that they report, both to enforcement services but also to us as researchers. Uh, players often dismissed racial slurs and casual sexism as not a big deal, um, but just an unfortunate part of gaming that it was their responsibility to counteract uh, with their thick skin. So that's important to remember when we're trying to collect information about these experiences. Interestingly, online harassment also affects people's categorization of games as well. 
Players are more likely to exclude games from categories if their early negative experiences with games in that genre conflict with later positive experiences with other games. For example, a lot of people in our research had negative early experience with, with shooter games. They didn't consider themselves shooter players. Uh, but then they later had positive experiences with a few games like The Division and Overwatch, with, which they mentioned specifically, uh, and they didn't consider those games to be real shooters. And they had all kinds of explanations and reasons why they thought that those games weren't real shooters, and they were less likely to think of themselves as shooter players, even if they spent hours and hours playing these games. So if we ask players like this about their time spent playing specific genres, we might get answers that um, are not really reflective of their experiences. And that can actually have a uh, disproportionate effect on players from my minority groups, uh, including women, people of color, and people from LGBTQ identities who are actually more likely to get harassed online. So these are tough challenges to fully overcome in our research, but we have a couple of recommendations. Um, first, ask people about experiences that they have seen negatively affecting others. It's often easier for people to talk about events that weren't as personally painful, and a lot of our participants actually talked about wanting to protect others, maybe others who haven't developed that thick skin yet. It was a motivation for them to report, and so they were much more willing to talk about incidents that they had seen happen to others. Another is to be careful about the language that you use when you are asking these questions. So, for example, we found that using words like harassment or targeted were actually too loaded. A lot of players often quickly mention that, no, I don't feel that way, or they even felt confused about why we were asking the question in the first place. So using slightly more neutral phrasing like uh, negative experiences or even just asking players if they'd ever reported someone for bad behavior um, elicited more responses and was actually more likely to capture the behavior that our players consider to be lower level incidents. Also, asking from multiple angles um, is a good recommendation. So simply asking players to walk us through what a typical gaming session looked like for them, or asking them what were some good and not so good things about online multiplayer gaming actually got a lot of responses about harassment and toxicity, even though we weren't directly asking about that in those questions. And finally, we should be specific about what we want to know and what we're asking players. For example, if we're asking players about experiences in certain genres, we might actually want to use example games when we're talking about those genres, either instead of or in addition to actually naming the genre in the question. And that can ensure that we're capturing the kind of information and the people that we actually want. However, there is a danger of going too far in research and focusing solely on player identities. You can end up over-categorizing or stereotyping players, which washes out individual differences and intersections of experiences that exist in all groups. So make sure that you're treating player identities in proportion with all of your other research inputs when you're make, doing analysis. All right, so after doing all that kind of work to help reduce uh, bias in the user research process, it's really important that that work actually is integrated into the machinery of making a game. Uh, if the user research insights are not integrated, you're not actually reducing the game development bias. Uh, and otherwise, if it's not really deeply integrated into the decision-making process of a team, the uh, biases we talked about can really still run rampant. The false consensus bias, curse of knowledge, confirmation bias, all of those can affect the way the team thinks about players and makes their decisions. However, in addition to deeply integrating into the research process, there's one other important thing for avoiding bias in, uh, for helping user research provide an unbiased perspective. And that is independence. Uh, so it's really important that researchers stand apart from influence. So in our organization, there are several ways that we do this. First is that researchers 100% own everything about research. They always have final say on research, on results, on how things are messaged and uh, data interpretation is never left to the developers. So it's also really important that researchers are not simply presenting data. Uh, we not only learn what's going on, we get a deep understanding about what will help. So it's important that researchers are always advocating for directions for improvement. Uh, not becoming designers in terms of having a specific way the game should be designed, but al always pushing what would help players have a better experience. So next, it's really important that, uh, that you're predefining and defining success ahead of time so teams are accountable. So uh, in our group, uh, we have ways of defining good and bad results in advance. Uh, one thing is that we have 
uh, a lot of different comparison data. So we're able to uh, compare both to games in the genre, games over a longer history, and teams are unable to discount certain kinds of results because we can say that it's that is actively worse than other games that they look at as competitors. So one last one is in our organization, uh, researchers are never managed by a game team. Uh, they always report up outside of game teams. Uh, and this is this is really important so that there is not the pressure of pleasing your boss. Um, I think when you're reporting to a game team, uh, I think everybody can try to be independent, but at the end of the day, you're trying to make your boss happy. And if you if you're outside of that team, that doesn't that doesn't have to be a consideration anymore. So related to this, here are some two last biases that should keep us all on our toes and working hard to improve things. One is the bias blind spot. As humans, we're much better at identifying other people's biases than we are at identifying our own. So make sure that you always have multiple researchers with different perspectives involved to check one another. All right, and here's one very last, especially insidious one, uh, which is the moral credential bias. So let's say, You've done work to research uh, to, to reduce bias, uh, and you've been recognized for reducing that bias. You've been rewarded in some way, recognized by the organization for it, uh, which is great. But sadly, research has shown that getting that recognition, getting that reward, actually it makes it more likely you're going to make future biased decisions. <laughs> and this goes back to those automatic mental shortcuts that we were talking about at the beginning. Once you've been recognized and somebody said, good job for reducing bias, there's some part of our brain that says, oh, good, that work's done. I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> so that makes it really critical, kind of as with all the things we've talked about today, that you're really deeply building, uh, deeply building bias reduction techniques into everything you do. If you're just relying on people to remember it or do it ad hoc, that's something where those biases can easily uh, sneak their way back in and you have exactly the same problems you're trying to combat in the first place. All right, so to recap what we discussed today, first we took a journey through the positive and negative biases that we all have as humans and how those biases affect our thinking and the judgments that we make. Second, we explored how even though our job descriptions are to provide an unbiased perspective to our game development teams, uh, those same biases can creep into the games user research process. And third, we talked about some work that we're doing to reduce those biases and maximize benefits for players. And we discussed some lessons that are important for reducing bias anywhere it can be found. So I hope you can take all of this and use it. Thank you. Uh, and here's a list of some resources that you can refer to, and we'll leave it up while we answer questions. Hi. Um, so early on, you talked about recruitment and how it could be biased recruiting from your company website or social media. I was wondering if you had uh, how or where you recruit your participants for uh, play test, user test. So um, one of the things that we've tried to do is go to locations that are a little bit more diverse or have representation from other folks. So um, for example, we've targeted conventions that are specific to um, like Geek Girl Con or to um, blurds like black nerds that are specific to specific groups that we're trying to reach out to um, and increase in a representation. And a lot of that um, requires liaisoning and looking out into the community and seeing what's going on. So keeping a finger on the pulse of what's going on in communities that we might not necessarily have our hooks into as much. So that's one of the techniques that we've used there. So another one uh, that we've used is by building into, uh, well, so actually on the Xbox platform as a whole, people can uh, opt in to being contacted by Xbox. And that's something that allows us to reach out to specific people who may never have reached out to us in the first place. Um, great talk. It, have you guys noticed from your own kind of um, observations on this that there's like a hierarchy of biases you start tackling or is it just kind of like um, a multifaceted universe and any particular developer or other stakeholder you're, work, you're talking to may have one or many of these they are suffering from 
in great, um, in, you know, to a great degree. I, I think the most often what I see, and part of why we talked about so many examples of it is the availability heuristic. I think uh, lots of people think I care a lot about customers, I'm getting feedback from customers, and don't really understand or think about all that feedback that they're not hearing about because they're only looking in certain places or hearing from certain customers. I think that's often, that's often one that, uh, especially if people are already working with researchers, one that, that can, can uh, most skew how would they think about their players. I'd also say uh, social influence is probably another one that we see a lot. Um, a lot of our teams like to look at the forums uh, to get feedback from people, and they also like to bring people in in groups to talk about you know, opinions and things like that. So that's probably one of the other biggest ones that we see. But a lot of the teams do have a sort of multifaceted group as well. So uh, there's a couple of different angles that we address them from. I'll go. Um, so I know you talked about the underrepresentation of people who don't play games so much, or people who drop off. Those people, of course, are historically really hard to access. Um, you know, we've tried some things and we've had some success, but it's still a really hard challenge. Do you have any tips for reaching those people, and getting them to talk? One of the things that I do is when I'm um, at conventions or talking to people about recruiting, um, I get a lot of people who approach me and they're like, oh, but I don't think I'm so much of a gamer. Um, and I ask them, like, do you play mobile games? I, start, I usually start there, do you play games on the PC? Do you play, you know, lots of games that people don't necessarily think of as games? And I'm like, you're a gamer. <laughs> you should definitely consider you know, participating. I also talk to a lot of people and reassure them, like, we test people who don't play games because we're interested about bringing new people into the, into the audience. So a lot of it is uh, our, a lot of our ad hoc work at showing up at conventions um, in places where people um, might have come with a friend. Um, we actually meet a lot of people at gaming conventions who came with a friend and they say, I'm not really a gamer. And they sort of spread that throughout their network that like, oh, you know, Xbox does test people who don't play games, or they test people who maybe don't play the games that we traditionally think of as real games, so to speak. Um, and so part of that is really about helping redefine what we think of as a gamer and, and spread the word that we're actually testing a wide variety of people. Yeah, I think another part of it, too, is uh, we often do... We often do broader research that isn't specifically about, hey, did you play this game or did you recently play this game, but we... We, a secondary goal of that is including some things that may help us hit some of those people who are former players, just like, hey, we just want to ask about your gaming in general, and, and oh, you did, you did stop playing that game? Oh, we'd love to talk to you more about that. And I think, I think the, often the, with a direct contact, asking about a specific game, if people are, are like, I don't play that anymore, I don't care, they're not gonna respond to that, but more general, more general research about gaming, you may be able to better reach them. Thank you. All right. Good. Thank you. <laughs>